a couple of things that are going on. Today, of course, is family day. You know the routine for that. There'll be a carry-in dinner after the second service. Everyone is invited to that. Also, we need to have a business meeting today, and that's for the purpose of going over the final quarterly report last year and then the annual report. Uh, that won't take long, so we'll take care of that uh, before we go over to the fellowship barn. The big event. The uh, annual VCA Chili Supper. That is next Saturday. Time to get busy, Donna. <laughs> All right, uh, that's from 4 to 6 o'clock. Um, it's a couple of things different this year. We'll probably have some unique things in the auction. We're going to have things for children this year. And also, we're asking if folks want to donate things, uh, follow the items for the the auction and Donna, as usual, has went around and got up a lot of gift certificates and stuff. Uh, so that's a little bit different. And then also we're asking if you would like to bring your favorite chili. Not a contest, because Donna can't stand losing. So. <laughs> but anyway, I guess you, you maybe can get an attaboy out of it or something. So we'll have a, a lot of different kinds of chili there. So I invite you to come and be a part of that. It's always a a great time. All right, then looking forward next, not next Sunday, but two Sundays we have our uh, DVD in the 10 o'clock hour. Then for uh, February, work days on 26, family day 27. All right, enough of that. So Bruce is going to come lead songs. Lead us in a song. Stand if you're able, I think. That's. 66 in your hymnal, 66. you may be seated. Uh, we're changing things up a little bit this morning. We never do that around here, right? right. Uh, Colton has uh, since God's call upon him to preach, and so I've been trying to give him opportunities to do that. He shares a, a devotion. I know it kills him because I, I limit it to 15 minutes <laughs> on Wednesday night. Uh, so we could give him that opportunity and decided maybe that once a month we might let him share in the 10 o'clock service and then uh, move Landon to the 11 o'clock service. And uh, again, we're just going to give it a try, see how it goes. It gives 
give opportunity to preach, and then Lane an opportunity to preach to the to the uh, big crowd. All right, the eleven o'clock crowd. Now, let me say this: If you are thinking that I'm just trying to get out of preaching, you are dead wrong. I, I love preaching, and it was hard for me to do this. So this represents a sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, but again, we want to give him up. You know, the best way to learn how to swim, get in the water. Right. right. So young preachers, they need the opportunity. So I'm going to turn it over to him at this time for our scrutiny and careful observation. <laughs> no pressure. No. All right. Good morning. Morning. He talks about throwing you in the water. That's just like my grandfather did it. But I uh, didn't swim at that time, so hopefully that's not what happens today. If you have a Bible with you, please open to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. <clears throat> We're going to be starting in verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. I was going over just a bit of what I wanted to, what God wanted me rather to preach on, and honestly, it was kind of easy this time around because it's something that's been on my heart um, for a long time. Um, and I was thinking about it, and because uh, Hannah and I, I we kind of got asked by a friend of mine, he's like, well, how long have you been doing the kids' ministry? And I was like, ah, oh, not that long at all. And then I started thinking about it, and I started counting back, and I realized it's been like eight years. Wow. <laughs> and I realized, oh, <laughs> that's kind of a long time, really. Um, and then I started thinking about all the kids that I've seen actually go through my, uh, the youth group and kind of who's there now, and then thinking, but where are some of the other ones? And for the last few months, it's actually been kind of eating at my heart more and more, this kind of issue. And today, I really want to kind of focus in, I think, on an issue that we may be aware of and probably are, but I think it's important that we need to refocus ourselves a little bit. If you would read with me again, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. This is Moses speaking to the Israelites. But in these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk to them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and your gates. And bow your heads in a word of prayer with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you again just for your great grace and mercy. Father, I thank you for your word. And Father, I thank you for people, Lord, a family, a body of Christians, Father, brothers and sisters that truly do love you. And Father, I'm always blessed to think of how great, Lord, it is to be able to serve here and just know these people and father know you but god i pray now that you would speak in my heart and help me to speak clearly the things you've put on my heart and that maybe lord we together listening to your word would be challenged by you in christ's name i pray amen as i read this passage it's opening up to kind of the crux of the issue here god commands through Moses, Israel, to really consume their lives in his word. Everything that he said, he says, I want you to go to sleep thinking about this. I want you to wake up thinking about this. When you are just sitting there, I want you to think about this. I want you to write my scripture on the doorposts in your house. I thought it was interesting when I used to work for uh, a company, we delivered drywall and steel there were a few houses and construction companies I found, they actually do that while they're building houses. 
You'll go up there and the bare skeletons on every doorpost, if you go up there, there's scripture written in on every doorpost. And that verse always came to mind and I kept thinking, man, I wish I could have done that. Just, but I don't have the money to go bear <laughs> my house out and do it over again. But you know, we put up some scripture, I think, in our houses, correct? But how much do we really spend time meditating on that scripture? Is it decoration or is it something we really do meditate on? Is it something that we put up? Because at first we're like, yeah, through Christ I can do all things. We've joked about that in our men's meeting a few times. People always take a verse out of context. Terry was talking about how when he would go to the gym, or maybe it was Landon, either one, but you go and they're like, yes, through Christ, he gives me strength to do all things. And they would push with all their might. And then they were like, yeah, and they'd give praise to God, which giving praise to God in all things is wonderful. But that's not really the context of the verse. And I kind of wonder in how many of our own lives we put up verses in our houses, scripture in our houses, and yet we kind of just take that snippet. Is that the only snack we get in the day? And if that's the snack we're getting, what about our children? See, a sad fact is that children are leaving the church. Children are not returning to the church. Like I said, when I was going over in my head of the youth group and remembering just the kids that were here. Now, it's a good thing, in my view, when a kid leaves, I don't think kids should just be staying in the same church. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm not for, I'm looking around saying, where are the same people that I had eight years ago? No, I'm saying the big C, not just the little C. Here we have, I call this the little C, our little family, our church. But I mean the corporal church, the entire church. They're not coming back. They're not staying in the faith. They're not walking with Christ. Why is that? The facts are, by the most recent polls and surveys, 70 to 88% of teens, once they leave for freshman year of college, do not come back. After the first year of college. A poll by LifeWay Research says nearly 70%. It's still in the 70% range. Question is, why? Well, the LifeWay Research poll said virtually all, 96%, said it was a change in their life situation and habits for stopping. The same poll said the top five reasons listed was moving to college and stopping attendance, Church members seemed judgmental or hypocritical, didn't feel connected to, those, to that church, which I think that is the same problem, didn't feel uh, disagreed with the stance on political and social issues, and one close and to the last, as the top five reasons, remember, work responsibilities prevented me from attending. I don't want to get too much into each one of these particularly, but just kind of looking through that list when I was thinking about it, praying on it, you know, there are issues I see here. Moving to college, stopping attendance. Again, 96% said they changed their life situations and habits. To me, that tells me they probably never had a real relationship in the first place. It probably means that they came out of habit. Right now, as we had gone through the pandemic, a lot of churches are experiencing this. They look around now at emptier pews. See, the habit got broken. The habit for some people now is, I don't, well, I was going, but now, you know, COVID hit, we stopped kind of coming, we got caught up in other things, and I don't go anymore. I think the same can be said for that reasoning there. Church members seem judgmental and hypocritical, I think goes in ties with didn't feel connected to their church. See, how can you say to other church, to your own church, to your family, you seem hypocritical if you don't know them? And I think that's another issue. I don't think children feel very a part of the family. Yeah. Yeah. They come, and what happens? The parents send them off to Sunday school. Yeah, they've got their friends, they've got that system there, but they don't know everybody else. 
So when they're out of Sunday school and it's time for them to go to another church, well, they don't have that same relationship we have with each other. They're foreigners, really, in a church they've probably grown up their entire lives. Now, the disagree with political, social issues, we'll get to that in a moment. I think there's something bigger. I don't think that we really take seriously the education that our children really get. And again, work responsibilities prevented me from attending. You know, I've, I often hear, and I've, all, I've kind of had this disagreement for a while, but you know, we've, we have 10 commandments, correct? We were given the 10 commandments, and we said, well, that's the law. But we would never say that if I started lying. If I start committing adultery, my question is, then why is it when it comes to keeping the Sabbath day holy, do we not keep the Sabbath day holy? I'm not saying what day that is. I'm not going to get on that horse. I'm not going to argue, well, it's Saturday. Well, it's Sunday. Well, it's this. No, no, no. I'm saying why do we not teach our kids the proper way of saying there should be one day a week you keep holy, and maybe you should keep it that way too. See, so many people in the church right now, what are they doing? They're probably going out on sports on Sundays. And at first it's like, well, it's just a sport, and I can witness there, and that's my church there. But see, God didn't say that you should, well, there's some exceptions. No, he said to keep it holy. I mean, separate. A day separated, just one day for him. You know, in the ancient, the Hebrews, the Sabbath day to them wasn't just them going and gathering together or going and listening to Scripture. See, when he says to keep it holy, he meant, well, what would honor God? Well, one of the one things we know that honors God is when we obey is family. Honor thy father and mother. He just taught them whatever you're doing when you're teaching Whatever you're doing when you wake up, when you sit, when you go out, when you're just simply eating together, while you walk along the way, take time to teach, to meditate on my word. And I think that's something we miss is when we start saying, well, you know, there are exceptions for one day a week. We begin to lose the children and their thought process and how important it really is to be here. But again, that's not the heart of the issue, I don't think. See, the heart of the issue is kids are probably not getting enough of their daily bread. They're being starved out of the ministry. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Christ is likening Scripture to as important as food. Do you get that? We must eat from the Word of God. How many of you have missed a meal in the last couple days? We wouldn't miss a meal, but we're going to miss our chance to eat from the Word of God. And I'm not standing up here in a pulpit... Smack, oh, I am standing out of pulpit, but I'm not smacking it saying, how dare each and every one of you? I'm guilty of the same thing. Sometimes I'm just snacking on the day. But has God ever really pained your heart to say, I should be spending more time in his word? I, I'm missing a meal every time I miss time with God. He likens it to milk and meat even. The Word tells us that that's how we grow strong. We get little bits of milk, and we need to wean off. We need to do the heavier, weightier things. How many of us are still maybe weighing on milk? How many of our kids have grown up now in the church, Sunday school, at home, and they're still stuck on milk? Not that they don't have learning to go, but there should be a point where they're starting to learn a little bit more of the meatier things. Why is that? See, how are we supposed to expect them when they come out 
And they're on their own to put on the armor of God if they're not fit and strong enough from the word of God to even wear it in the first place. Christian families, on average, spend 30 minutes a week on Bible studies. 30 minutes. You know how much they spend in seat hours in school from the time that they get in to the time they get out? 14,000 hours. And that's the low end. 14,000 hours. And what about games, entertainment, sports? Again, Deuteronomy 6, 6, verse 6 and 7, these commandments that I give you today are to be in your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you lie down and when you get up. Joshua 1.8. Boy, they didn't listen to Joshua at all, did they? This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Well, for me to have good success, what do I have to do? Spend time on it day and night. You know, it's not just saying, well, here's my time in the morning. Here I come. Now let's say continue. Again, go back to Moses. He said, I don't care what you're doing. You need to meditate on his word. And they only had, at the time when Moses wrote it, they only had the first five books. He wasn't talking to the Levites. And here we are supposed to be royal priests for Christ. The question becomes then, who is really discipling our children? Again, 14,000 seat hours in school from start to finish, right before college. If you kind of do the math out with that 30 minutes a week, 358 hours of Bible-related things from start to finish. I've often used this analogy before. It's an old Native American analogy, but you know, you have a good wolf and a bad wolf. It's a bad, terrible, well, it's not that bad of an example, but it's not very biblical. You have a good wolf and a bad wolf. The one that grows stronger is the one you feed more. We know that to be true. God's word tells us if we spend more time in the flesh, endeavoring in the things of the flesh and the world, we're going to become more like the world. Christ saved you from it, but you still got to keep walking along the path with him. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Isn't that an amazing scripture right there? See, that's the one hope I have, especially with my children, and my hope I have even with some of the people. I'm like, where are they? My hope is that promise right there is that they have been taught. And so even if right now they might be kind of squirreling away, veering off the path, that Christ will still be in their hearts, that the seed is still in their hearts. Yes, they may have a choice, but I'm taking that promise to say, you know what? It's still going to be coming back to them. The Word of God is living. It's the most powerful thing we have in this world. It's the most powerful thing that's ever been in this world. It's Christ. Amen? Amen. This message isn't to get us down so much as to revitalize us and to remember where our faith comes from, where the power comes from. Something that I needed while I was thinking again, where are these kids? Luke Chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. And this goes back to who is discipling our children. Where are they getting discipled from? How much time are they? Again, 14,000 hours in seat in school, only a few Bible-related things, probably in their lifetime. Again, we're talking about starvation here. 
when you're at home with the kids? How much time do we spend with them? Grandparents, you've got that responsibility too. We do. We, anybody right now who has a relationship, your family member, anybody who has any sort of relationship or ability to talk with your family and loved ones, you have that responsibility. That means if they're not getting a lot already at home, you need to come in and be able to help them get a little bit more. We all have that responsibility, and I do believe it takes a village. I do believe that. But there's some responsibilities that we can't take care of. There's some responsibilities, admittedly, we can't do. Grandparents, you probably could chastise and correct your grandkids. I think, I, I personally think you should. My grandfather did. But the authority solely is really to the parent. Luke chapter 6, verse 40, again, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone he is fully trained will be like his teacher. This is true in the opposite way. See, we wonder why our kids aren't staying when we send them off to schools who don't teach about Christ. We ever think about that for a moment? Vody Bachman, and I, great evangelist and preacher and teacher, he said, why are we surprised when we send our kids to be taught by Caesar and they come out as Romans? You send them off to college, and they come back with a whole different philosophy, a whole different idea, and they don't stick with Christ. Why? Because they've spent more time with their teachers. Verse, Scripture says it right here in Luke chapter 6. Everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Who's teaching them? Parents, that's on us. That's on me, my responsibility with my children. That's something that frightens me to death. That's a great responsibility, but what a privilege it is. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See, that is the issue. We allow our kids to go out into the world, and it's not that they can't go out in the world. It's the fact that we purposefully say it's okay to go there and listen to them. It's okay for you to go there and understand what they're... And we may give the excuse, well, you go there, you listen, you learn, you get taught a few things, but don't really believe in what they say. But the problem is they're just kids. They don't know what they're doing. We're setting them up for failure. And the sad fact is when we do that, the responsibility lies on us. Amen. We have nobody to blame but ourselves, unfortunately. But we need to be serious. See, again, the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. When you send them out on their own and they're not fully equipped and trained and, again, fit enough because they weren't getting enough to eat in the first place to wear the armor of God, they're not going to be able to swing that sword. They're not going to be able to swing the sword of God. They're not going to be able to use the shield of faith to protect against the wiles and the darts of the evil one. We set them up for failure. The responsibility and privilege is to us, the parents. Psalms 127, verse 3 to 5. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Children are a gift from the Lord. And he says the more you have in your quiver, the more blessed you are. Uh, how many of you right now, don't raise your hand, don't really feel that way. It's tough. It's tough. <laughs> I have two of them, and that's tough enough. But see, we ought to be trained ourselves. Saying like a warrior, that's how they are. We are the warrior. We should be the master. 
We should be the ones teaching them and showing them. They are arrows. How do we do that? What does he mean by that? It means that my job is to guide them and point them in the right direction. See, they may not know what direction they're going in. They might not like it when I pull back on the, on the bow and just keep stretching them, stretching them. But like God does for us, we don't like when he stretches us out either. But it's because he loves us. Like an archer, we have an aim and guide where we want our children to reach and hit the mark. If we want our children to hit the mark, we had better take some time to aim for them. Proverbs 29, verse 17, Discipline your children and they will give you peace of mind and will make your heart glad. Discipleship must come from the parents. Discipline cannot come from a teacher or school because they are not equipped with the full authority and tools parents have with children. Vody Bauckham also makes this point, and I have to agree. The way things are, I honestly think we should abolish children's group. I think youth group shouldn't be a thing. Why? I feel like I get in the way sometimes. Not that I don't think I should be there to supplement and teach the kids. I love it. I enjoy it. I think that is important. But in the big church around, I mean, I'm talking about the corporal church. How many parents come to, to church and the first thing they do is they send them off to Sunday school? Then they come back. How was Sunday school? Good. Oh, awesome. You want to go to McDonald's? Go to McDonald's. And that's it. They get nothing. The parent assumes that they're getting all they need from the Sunday school. And that's it? Again, it goes back to the how much bread are they really getting. Is that it? That's all they're going to get? Don't expect them to grow. Why waste your time even come to church, honestly? Why waste your time? You say, whoa, Colton, that's... I'm here to hear the word of God. Yes, but your children need it too. We have responsibilities we can't shirk away from. And parent, teachers, I don't have, there's specific tools I don't have. Now, I'm not speaking about any, don't worry, I'm not speaking about any particular kids, okay? But I can't discipline kids. I can be a good teacher, but not as good as a parent can. Amen. Why? Because they have, well, a relationship that you guys know your kids better than I do. You know your grandchildren better than I do. But there's one very important tool that I can't use either. Disciples are discipled by discipline. Correction and instruction. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Proverbs Chapter 13, verse 24, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching a light and the reproofs of discipline are the way of life. See, correction can be corporal punishment. It says right here. That's true. For those quick, please don't do that. <laughs> for those quick, please stop doing that now. For the times as we should do with one another when you're about to fall off a cliff immediately. But it also talks about instruction. More often, for longer term goals, it should be used in tandem with instruction. In Romans 12, Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, it's not the reaper. See, some of us, and I'm guilty of it, we would like, uh, at the very beginning, when I, we, Hannah and I had first had Raiden, and it was like in the first uh, couple of years, we were in the mindset of discipline, and that was all he needed. 
That was bad. How is a kid, especially a kid that knows nothing, supposed to learn all they hear? Don't do that, don't do that. Well, what do I do? See, some of us, we use that hammer all the time. Sometimes we use the rod of correction too much. And then some of us have never picked it up before. It has to be a balance. It has to be a balance. If we want our kids to begin to change, it has to be starting with us. It has to be starting with daily bread. It has to be starting in Scripture. And there's something else. If we want their mind, because if we want their minds to be renewed, how are they supposed to be renewed? How are they supposed to know what to do, what not to do? How are they supposed to understand where they're going to go? How are they supposed to understand the God they truly have if we are not talking about it? as if it's just a casual part of our day. One of the amazing things that my kids have always put me to shame on and always shocked me on is, and I remember when I was helping one of the churches out, um, we were doing a, the kind of a, a, a go-to up to the Passover, and we were talking about Moses and what they did with the Israelites. And... My friend, Nathan, who was a pastor at the church at the time, he was speaking for, for a bit, and he looked at the kids. He's like, I want to teach you about the kids. And Raiden's little hand goes up. He's like, Raiden, what, you got something to say? Well, then Raiden just starts going off from the beginning of Moses <laughs> to the end of when they're out of the wilderness for about 15 minutes. He goes, well, I guess this is where the uh, sermon is done. <laughs> And it shocked me. And it put me to shame. Because at the time, I'm sitting here going, how did he know more than I did? <laughs> Must have good teachers. But it wasn't from me. And that's what put me to shame. See, why am I not the one having that relationship with my children? Why aren't we the ones to do that? And the final issue, the final thing that we need to be aware of here is saying, well, I give scripture. We do kind of have that. But here's the problem. Are you leading by example? Are we leading as disciples for Christ? James chapter 1, verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. You're saying, well, I can teach them to do things. Well, that's not the issue, I don't think. How many of us are sayers of the word but not doers? Are you practicing what you preach? I, again, I'm guilty of it too at times. Hey, you shouldn't let your anger get a hold of you. Give a verse. Later on in the day, I get upset. <laughs> And let my anger get a hold of me. And I laugh at it, but honestly, it's the God honest truth. And how terrible of an example that is. And I should be more heartbroken on it. And we all should be. When I teach my kids, you shouldn't say bad things. You shouldn't be speaking bad words. But yet, I'm at home watching TV or listening to things that literally every other word is a cuss word. Or Regardless, don't live in the world, but I'm still in the world. You're putting a higher standard on the kids, but you don't live it out yourselves. And God help us all. God forgive us. Are we as parents and grandparents, families, teachers? Are we going to be hearers or speakers of the word, but not do and leave what we say, what we profess to believe? Luke chapter 22, verse 26, 27, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Again, Christ being the greatest there ever was and ever will be. Serve. He said, 
Am I not the greatest? That's what the verse is saying. Am I not the one who should be reclining at table and you serving me? But here I am, broken bread and poured out wine for you. When we take communion, that's really the thought process here that we're supposed to be remembering. It's how Christ was broken bread. His body was worn and torn for us, that his blood was shed, that he sacrificed every bit for us. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. When you take of this cup and you eat of this bread, remember the sacrifice that I made for you. But remember this, I came as a servant. Go serve others. Serve me. Which means we have to serve our children. If I want to be an example to my kids, I had better be a really good servant. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And that's just the point. We ought to be imitators of God. It's interesting, he said, he didn't say be imitators of God and walk like men. To be imitators of God and be his children. Meaning, if I want my child to grow up, I had better start acting like a child. No. Although I think myself and some others included, we're just as children as the rest of them. But be imitators of God, loving one another, loving our children loving to serve him, and again, imitating him, following Christ. Having a relationship with our children, our family, it's as important as having a relationship with God. It really is. Why? Because it brings honor and glory to God the Father when we obey and put what's important, like our family, first. Again, I mentioned it, the ancient Hebrews, that's what they would do on the Sabbath day. They would take time to sit with their families and they glorifying God and honoring one another, caring for one another, just feasting like we're going to do later on today. That brings glory to God when we act like a family. Amen. You say, Colton, what about the broken families? Well, that's the point. Some families, some people don't have families, do they? And that's why it's so important for us to be that family. That's why it's important for us to reach out to one another. That's why it's important not to forget one another. That's why it's important for us, again, when somebody is low in their life and have a low point going on in their life, when somebody's sick, being that person saying, you know what, they may have COVID, but I'm still going to go over to the house and make sure they're taken care of. It's odd that we're so scared of COVID, but the uh, first century church wasn't scared of some leprosy. As we follow Jesus as a disciple, our children will follow too. But as we needed instruction and correction by God, we too have to take time to discipline our children. The question is, will Caesar, Satan, the world, teach and disciple them? Or will we take the mantle and responsibility God has given me and you and everybody in here and gifted us with, will we take that mantle up and do it? Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Again, Father, I just thank you for the awesome privilege of just being able to put what was on my heart. God, I, I, I love this church family. I love a family that's even bigger that I know some of them I haven't even met. I just love everybody that knows the name of Christ because I love you, because you love us, and I know, Father, that we all have an eternity. We will be with each other. And that you, prom- you say that we're brothers and sisters, but, Father, help us to take care of the children. Lord, please help us to impress on our children to be examples, men and women, For them, Lord, to show them where to go, Father. We were lost too, and you showed us where to go. You opened our hearts and our eyes, and you led us time and time again. Help us not to make it hard on our children and let them be lost in this world. Help us, Father, to give them guidance and direction, to be warriors 
Father, for them. Be to be advocates for them, Father, to bring you honor and glory in all that we do. But, Father, that our children would grow up to be great servants for you as well. Love you, Lord. Your will be done. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.